Make or Ma Moments is a conversation about leadership, entrepreneurship, and personal development. My guest today is Atedo Peterside, commander of the Order of the Niger. Mr. Peterside is the president and founder of ANAP Foundation, a non-profit organization committed to promoting good governance. At age 33, he founded Stambik IBTC Bank PLC, then known as IBTC. He became the Pioneer Managing Director, Chief Executive Officer from 1989 to 2007, and then became the Chairman for another seven years until 2014. He became the Chairman of Stambik IBTC Holdings PLC until 2017. Stambik IPTC Holdings reported 83 billion Naira profit after tax in 2020. Mr. Peterside is currently a director at the Standard Bank of South Africa Limited and the Standard Bank Group Limited. He is the chairman of ANAP Business Jets, ANAP Foundation COVID-19 Think Tank, at X Collective Limited, and Endeavor High Impact Entrepreneurship Limited. He serves on the African Advisory Board of the Princess Trust International, a charity founded by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, which tackles the global crisis of youth unemployment. Mr. Peterside has served Nigeria as the alternate private sector vice chairman of the Nigerian Industrial Policy and Competitiveness Advisory Council, as a member of the National Economic Management Team, and as the chairman of the National Council on Privatizations Technical Committee. Mr. Peter Said also served as the chairman of the Committee on Corporate Governance of Public Companies in Nigeria, which crafted the first Code of Best Practices for Public Companies Operating in Nigeria. He is currently the co-chairman of the Steering Committee for Nigeria's 2021 to 2025 Development Plan and the Vision 2050. My guest today attended King's College, Lagos and obtained a bachelor's degree in economics from the City University, London. He earned a Master's of Science degree in economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. His executive education is broad and varied. It includes the owner, president, management program of Harvard Business School. I'm glad to have our guest in the house, Mr. Atedo Peterside. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for having me, Aki. In a few words, who is Atedo Peterside? Well, I'm often described as an entrepreneur, an economist, and an investment banker. But I guess by way of description, and you cannot deny your history, I'm, be I'm probably best known as the founder of Stambik IBTC Bank. Good. We'll just you know, dive straight into this conversation because I believe there's a lot for us to, uh, to learn. I recall uh, in late 2005, you know, I sat, I sat next to you on a flight from, from Accra to Lagos. You know, uh, then I was overseeing um, Africa as a commercial manager for Virgin. And, you know, you express so much joy, you know, about Virgin's venture uh, in Africa and in Nigeria particularly. Uh, but that lasted a few years. Uh, as someone who has started a business from scratch in Nigeria, uh, and which is, of course, now uh, part of the largest bank in Africa, what is that one or two things that you find to be true about establishing and successfully running a business uh, in, in Nigeria that many will disagree with? 
You know, the, the thing is that um, if you have to begin by asking yourself whether you're competing. If you're competing, or, my, or any business I've been involved in, invariably, we, we had competitors. If you were competing, then for me, one of the most important things was to have a merit-driven organization and to take on the very best people you can find. Because can you imagine if you're in a service sector activity and you deliberately do not hire the best people you can find, then you are really saying that you want to use your second 11 to win a match. Is there any country that goes for the World Cup to, to fill the second 11? Even with your first 11, you may not win. Now that is the point that some of us drive home from, I mean, all the time in Nigeria, that even with your first 11, you may not win. So I think that was the driving force. So because, because I've been asked many times that, why did you always emphasize merit so much? That's the obvious reason. The only chance, the best chance I thought I had of succeed, for succeeding was to find the best ele first 11. Good, good, good. So I recall, you know, and, and, you know, perhaps, you know, I'm connecting the dots now. Um, I recall that you had a reputation then, you know, of interviewing new hires, you know, yourself. Um, so I've, I've always, you know, thought to ask you this. Now I have you on my program. Let me ask you, what were you looking for? And, and were there a few aha moments uh, that you had while engaging uh, fresh university graduates? Okay, yes, let me first explain that. It is true that for about the first 15 years, nobody entered IBTC without doing a final interview with me as CEO. Please, I use the word final interview. Final interview meant that even if they had been interviewed by a panel who had made recommendations, saying this person is fantastic, hire them. I was doing a final interview to either corroborate the findings of the panel or to disagree with them. Now, think about it very carefully. Of course, I trusted my staff, but if you have that kind of process, even an interview panel know that you better be careful because whoever we pick, uh, CEO is going to in, in independently interview the person. So if we pick an idiot and send him to a CEO, he's going to go there and disgrace us. So even for their own dignity, they wanted to make sure that for them, pass mark meant each time they send somebody to me, I will come back and say, yes, well done. This, this lady or this guy is fantastic. You need that kind of pressure. If you just delegated the interview to somebody else and they can do what they like, with due respects, eh, you need to put human beings under a system with checks and balances. So that my final interview was part of a system of checks and balances. There were few instances when I overruled an interview panel saying, I'm sorry, you got it wrong. This lady or this guy, I don't agree. And then we'll go back to the drawing board. So, 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 so that was the reason. But I emphasize checks and balances. Good, good. Were, were there any aha moments you had while engaging some of these okay, fresh okay, guys me, from school? Yes, okay. Let me also explain that my interview style, largely till today, is just to keep people talking. Sometimes the people come, come away thinking that, but well, this guy didn't even interview me. We, we just had a, a, a long chat, at the end of which I went home. But that long chat was an interview. In fact, ideally, especially for senior positions, I would like to sit down and have lunch with somebody. I just have lunch and discuss things normally, discuss everything under the sun. If you have an honest discussion, interaction with somebody over one hour having lunch or one hour, 15 minutes, you will get to know the person. Please don't get me wrong. Of course, it is also true that whilst the lunch came across as some unstructured, friendly chat, there were little things you were throwing in here and there to check out for the person's honesty, to check out for consistency, to find out if you, know, you, had, you, you had shared values and all that. So at the end of that whole process, you either came away thinking that I understand this person, or you came away thinking something is not right. This person is holding back. I don't believe their story. Please, I'm talking about even, even simple personal stories. Why do you want to leave your old employer? to come to IBTC? Simple question, somebody telling you the truth versus somebody lying. Please don't get me wrong, there's, there's nothing wrong in telling the truth. The simple truth like, I think I'm underpaid and I believe that I will get a, a much better pay deal from IBTC 
could be true. So it takes the boxes instead of telling the truth. Somebody else looking, lying over needless things. It's a worrying sign. You follow me? So you, you just have a chat with the person and each time the person is telling the truth, it gives you more confidence. Each time they are lying, holding back, distorting facts, and so on, you want that this person has already failed. Talking of those, those um, qualities, uh, what do you think the biggest gap is? Well, I think the, the, the number one thing is that everybody pays lip service to merit, but most of them don't want to practice it. You have to almost drag them screaming. There are things that people talk about because they're fashionable, succession planning, or um, in the merit-driven organization. But when you sit down and deal with them every hour, every day, you realize that they're just paying lip service. There are many institutions that, if you look at an institution, you know there's no succession plan. It, the, on the other hand, you have some other institutions which are the other extreme. Remember somebody telling me once when I was in IBTC that he, he heard two, two of our drivers talking in the car park. Just the people were talking because drivers sit together and they were talking about, oh, who do they think will run the bank after me? Somebody asked the question and that if there were seven drivers, five of them said Shola David Bora. Now who told them that? It turned out to be true. You understand me? So later on, when Shola David Bora came to run the bank, the guy came to me and said, you know what? I remember hearing your drivers talking, just gossiping, and I was hearing them that how come, how could the drivers know or predict who will be the future CEO at a time when the board has not even chosen? Because they can see a successful, successful plan, even if it has not been announced. So they can sense it. But when you work in an organization, and even the most senior people, talk, don't talk about, please, I respect drivers. The most senior people don't have a clue what the plan is. And yet that you have a, a solid succession plan and so on. And guess what? People don't understand that succession planning is also linked to being able to lead managers. Part of the reason why the best managers will stay with you is because they realize that it's a merit-driven organization and you have plans for them to take over from you. And you have plans for future better managers to in, in due course take over as well. So people are staying because they know they can rise to the top. When you talk about glass ceilings, so they were staying in IBTC because they knew there was no glass ceiling. It didn't matter whether you were a man, whether you were a woman, everybody knew if you were the best, you could get to the top. Now, in many organizations, it's not so. I don't want to name names. There's some organizations where if you are not Yoruba, you won't get to the top. Or if you are not Igbo, you won't get to the top. Or if you're a woman, you won't get to the top. But if it's a merit-driven organization with the kind of succession plan that everybody can buy into with a shared vision, the truth is that everybody qualifies on paper is for them to distinguish themselves. It's like the Olympic Games. Everybody can compete. You, you can sit down in your house and plan that you want to become a sprinter and one day compete in the Olympic Games. Nobody's going to stop you. First, you have to qualify. If you beat everybody in your own country, you will get to the Olympic Games. If you, if you beat everybody in your heat, you progress to the next round. So at the end of the day, somebody is going to emerge through that process. But that's because there's a credible process and it is fair. The same applies in the company. If, and also, like attracts like. When people see that this company has a structure, they have succession planning, people can all go in there and plan their lives around the company. Then young people who are brilliant, with a, and, and very competent and naturally attracted to that same company because they believe they have a future there, men and women. In the past three years, fintech investments in Nigeria uh, grew by about 200%. Um, they have been able to raise about $1 billion in funding. Uh, what advice do you have for, for fintech founders who are struggling through policy constraints in Nigeria? I mean, first of all, they have my sympathy and I, and I think I would like them to be patient and to persevere because time is on their side. You know, every foolishness must stop one day. The fact is that when you're in a business like FinTech, sometimes you are even ahead of the authorities. So you, you will always have this, you will face this temporary difficulty. 
where you are so far ahead of them that they don't really understand you. You have to now be patient and invest more in trying to get them to understand you and to understand what you're up, up, up and about. If you give up too quickly, then you lose the plot and somebody else will do it after you. So that's, that's my advice to them. You've got to be patient and you've got to persevere. Good. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for that encouragement to, uh, to FinTech founders. Uh, yourself and the leadership team uh, in, in IBTC, you built a strong culture. How can business owners or CEOs, how can they align um, organizations uh, with the founders' vision and mission? What advice do you have for, uh, for such leaders? You see, the thing is that I think you can only build an organization if you're a founder with a team of people around you who have a shared vision. When you have a shared vision, as you're, as you're working together, you will, a culture will emerge. And if you have a shared vision and you're a cohesive team, you will all be part of, of deriving that culture. I mean, I take an example. I'll give just one example. It may sound trivial. You know, in IBTC, we had a culture where everybody was to call everybody on the first name basis. So even when I was CEO, every employee was supposed to call me an app, or sorry, supposed to call me at the door. I'll tell you how, it, how an app came about. Supposed to call me at the door, and at the beginning it worked. They were calling me at the door, first name. I called them first name as well. You know, um, Shola or Inca or Obina and so on. You know, Tony. And then, some years later, about 10 years or thereabouts, the youngest people in the organization came and, and, and complained and said they had a problem. But while they loved this first name idea, it was putting them in trouble. Because imagine you're a young lady, you're a young guy, you're at home, you're on the phone. You, you got a job in IBTC, you're talking on the phone. And then you say something like, oh, then Atido said this, this, this. Your mother or father overhears you. And, and flips and says, look, if I, you have no home training. So somebody gave you a job and you are calling him material, is he your mate? You know, that's tough. So they had a problem. So those young people now decided that when they were outside and people may, may be hearing them, instead of calling my name, they would use my initials. So they put your ANA pizza side and so they, they would say a nap. So that people around won't know who they're talking about because they were safer near their parents talking about an app did this, an app said the other, and an app did this, I disagreed with him and so on. The parents didn't know who an app was. So they then came back and formally sought permission that look, instead of us deceiving the organization, when we're in here nine to, eight to five, we say at the door, when we step out, we, 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 we use the nickname an app or his initials. Why, doesn't, why don't we formally allow the organization that an app is as good as at the door because both are sort of um, informal and serve the same purpose. So the management agreed with them and I also had no problem, they're fine. If, if you are saying that you are more comfortable calling your CEO an app, a nickname which you gave him, then feel free to call him an app. So some would call an app, some would still call it a dog. Can you now see what I mean by culture evolves? There was the same shared vision to be informal but sincere and give feedback that look, this informal culture is putting me in trouble at home with my parents or, or my uncle and so on. So can we modify it slightly? So that's what I'm telling you that the culture is something that evolves. I can give you countless other stories of that type where the younger people modified the culture as they came in. So the culture, the culture that emerged was, was something that yes, people say, Probably the biggest influence came from the founder in terms of merit-driven organization and all that. But the details and reinforcing it came from everybody else. Indeed, interesting story uh, on how you became known as a, a now. What what habits what habits do you think made you uh, a successful business owner? You know, I'll again, I'll tell you one more. Story. As you know, your questions, the stories. I'm sure you've, you've, you've probably heard of or read the book by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. What if I tell you that the person that first exposed me to that book, bought a copy and gave it to me as a present, was my secretary in IBTC. Many, people, many of our staff used to go for courses or something, go back, go out, 
and they want to buy a present, they buy me some fat book from the bookshop and bring it home. Well, I said, hang on a second. I'm tired of collecting all these fat books. Like, Why did you choose this book? Said, well, I went to a bookshop and I just saw the book and it looked nice. So I bought it for you. So, so, so I made a rule. I said, you know what? Don't buy me a book that you've not read yourself. So if, if you want to give me a, a book as a present, get a book, read it. Decide that it's a book you want me to read and then give it to me as a present. So when I ask you, why did you give me this book? You're able to give me the answer. So my secretary or PA in IBTC came one day, bought me a present, she gave me this book, um, Seven Habits by Stephen Covey. I heard about the book. It was very early in the book's life. I heard about the book like in Financial Times or something, but it was just like one of many new books that came out. She gave me this present. I asked her, why did you buy me this book? Get a nap, I read it, eh? and guess what? All the habits they're talking about are the same things you have, you have been emphasizing in the office every day, that we should put first things first and all kinds of things. So I, so I thought, wow, this is unbelievable. Let me buy this book and give it, give it, give it to an app. So to, to answer your question, therefore, I honestly believe that it's the exact same habits that Stephen Covey emphasized is successful. So that many people were successful follow. Interestingly, many years later, I met Stephen Covey himself in South Africa. And even the day I read his book, I mean, half the things he was saying are things that I discovered on my own. In any case, if you don't put first things first, what do you want to put first? Last things. If you don't think win win, how do you want to think? You want to think win lose? Don't you even see that the story I told you about? People changing the culture and calling me a nap. It's about thinking win-win. Because the earlier policy of calling me at the door, they, they were losing when they went home. But by changing it, by allowing them to use at the door or the nickname or the, or the initials, it was win-win because everybody was satisfied. So it's about the greatest good for the greatest number. Sometimes even in Nigeria, we fight over it that the priority should be about the greatest good for the greatest number. Great, great, great reflections there. Thank you. Thank you so much, even for uh, for sharing uh, all those uh, all those stories and all those all those experiences. Very, very useful. Thank you so, so very much. Whether or not we're conscious of it, success or failure in life is a submission of choices we make and the decisions we take. When we make a choice, we forgo the consequences of the alternatives. That is um, what the economists call um, um, the opportunity cost. Uh, because man is finite, we choose to invest in this or invest in that, attend to this or attend to that, push forward or pull back, say yes or say no. Uh, someone said successful people uh, make the right decisions early and manage the decisions daily. Of course, all you need are a few bad decisions to wreck your life. Could you tell me of a time when you had to make a difficult decision, which you knew its outcome has the potential to either make or mar you? You know, I think I would answer that question from the perspective of a complex industry like the banking industry or one that's regulated. Because in the regulated industry, apart from the normal challenges of facing the competition, you know, you know, all the um, supply chain and all of the other stakeholder staff and so on, you also have the regulator to contend with. For me, some of the biggest decisions that I took as a CEO and later on as a chairman was when to fight a regulator. There were some pivotal moments when you knew that the future of the institutions you know, rested on you this leading a fight against a regulator who was trying to, to entrench injustice. You see, the truth is that even with a very sound business, it can be destroyed by a bad regulator. At the same time, nobody's going to wake up every morning and be fighting the regulator every day. For what? You're not, you're not in business to fight a regulator. I'm talking about some fundamental issues, especially when people accuse you of doing something wrong when you've done everything right. If you don't stand up and fight 
at such instances. When are you ever going to fight? And please, uh, if you built an institution, believing and knowing that every single day, everybody came to work trying to do everything right, it becomes almost impossible for you to accept or to plead guilty on behalf of your staff that they did something wrong when they did nothing wrong because they, you are being accused falsely or they are being accused falsely. If you don't stand firm at such times, you will even lose the respect of your staff. So for me, those were the biggest decisions. People ask me sometimes that, ah, they remember in 2005, I took out the full page adverts, you know, I mean, disagreeing with the CPN governor on the issue of when he said that um, we could not retain our banking, our investment banking license and so on. Yes, that was a big decision. But it was also done for posterity and because it was after engaging and you knew there was a fundamental disagreement and so we decided to go public with the disagreement. I was not going to just wake up. We've done nothing wrong. Somebody said we should surrender our investment banking license. We were given the license by the government from the beginning. We wanted to be investment bankers. We were given, we were given an investment banking license. We have done nothing wrong. We were successful. Suddenly somebody says, I will that business again. I say, hang on a second, what have you done wrong? I say, well, no, 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 but I've, I've, changed, I've changed my mind that I'm, you know, that's under my tenure, you cannot do that business again. A business that's been done in the UK, in the US, everywhere. A, a business that was being done in Nigeria, you know, right from, from when I was 21. What is wrong with investment banking as a business? I couldn't understand the arguments being made, being made. So do you just accept and say, okay, I just hereby surrender my investment banking license, or do you fight it as best you can? Please don't get me wrong. I did not say you must win every fight. But if you don't stand firm and articulate your points, and if need be, go to the to, to higher authorities and even go to the general public, then the alternative is what? People know that anybody can come to you any day and say, we close you down for this and you will accept. You kneel down, you kneel down. Jump up, you say, how, you know, how high and all that. People, people have to have a sense that we have to be a little bit careful with this institution because if you just go there, they've done nothing wrong and start accusing them of all kinds of things. They, will, they, they might fight you, not because they're fighting you because they want to fight you, but because you've left them with no choice. So the point I'm making is that those are hard decisions. And, and I've, I felt sad each time that we ever had to um, confront a regulator. You know, it happened once with Central Bank, once with, with the Financial Reporting Council. And please, for the record, this is why I said we do things for posterity. All the things we fought about, and we told them then, the same regulator shortly after, or after they were replaced has reversed those things. So therefore, when I was telling CBN that, even if you succeed in telling me to surrender my next my investment banking license, I bet you the next CBN governor will come back and say, but this is foolish and then reinstate it. Please, the next very, the very next CBN governor came back to reinstate investment banking license, investment banking license. Financial reporting council, the things they said we should change in our accounts are not, not not treat our accounts this way. By the time the new council was in, they reversed that wrong decision and said, which means in effect we were right. That the only thing you can do is to treat this transaction this way in your books. Because that's what the whole world does. So I want to show you that. And also, you know, even regulators respect you when they know that you understand your business. You know, so it's not that it's sad, but ordinarily, one should not have to contend with such situations. There are people who would have worked in, in Europe all their lives and never had, never had to worry about being accused falsely by a regulator. But then we're in Nigeria, we're in Africa, we're in a different set of development. So entrepreneurs here have to be ready with con to contend with all sorts of things, including the odd negative or wrong ruling by a regulator. So during the period when you were pushing back on the on the regulators, there must have been uh, um, backlash or you know consequences. Some people ask me the question that why do I 
always speak out. I didn't start speaking out today on, on national issues. I was speaking out from age 22. I was speaking out and writing and saying what was right, what was wrong. Some people say, look, how come you are able to speak out? And most other people in a similar position never speak out in Nigeria. You see, it's about what you think you are, what you think life is about, who you think you are, what you think your country needs. It's easy, there are choices we all make. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know those who have chosen that their path is to be a praise singer. It doesn't matter who is in Abuja, every, every morning they wake up and praise the person. That's a choice. But everything that I've ever, ever since the internet was created, every article I've ever written, every article I've ever published is available on the website of Anna Foundation for Posterity. Every position I've taken on anything is there. And all those things, I have no reason to go, go back and hide them. Because if I was arguing against US subsidy 10 years ago, I still stand in that position today. So all that it does is that people can check when you first came out speaking against something. So everything is there. So you, can either, you either want to be known for somebody who has no views or comments on anything concerning your country. Or if you're somebody who believes that a part of your responsibility beyond just succeeding in business, making some money and putting it in the bank, is to take an interest on, and speak out about things that are wrong, that could improve the lot of your countrymen and women. The choice is yours. The easier option is to keep quiet and put your money in the bank. Those were big decisions. They were the biggest decisions. You don't wake up as a bank CEO and take on the CBN governor. You don't wake up as a bank chairman and take on the 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 um, the, the CEO of the of the financial reporting council lightly. Those are those are the big decisions, decisions that have to do with winning some business here, winning some business there. I think those are easy decisions that happen every day, with everybody faces, with everybody does. The one I'm telling you are the ones that most people will shy away from. But those are the ones that define who you are and what you are and what you stand for. Thank you so very much. Thank you for for you know shedding light even on those uh, on those on those topics and on those themes and sharing your views and your your experiences and your thoughts as well. Um, is there any is there anything in your in your mind anything on your in your heart that you just like to share uh, before we round off this this conversation? I guess I brought it in already. The one because many people often ask me. But why am I outspoken all the time, you know, on the economy, on the politics, on everything? Sorry, it's usually in Nigeria for activists, people who are not part of the business establishment, follow me, so that when they say it's unusual, they mean for somebody who is an entrepreneur, a businessman, and all that, you know, even a banker and all that, they're saying, why are you outspoken, aren't you afraid, or things like that, you know. But the answer, the obvious answer is that if you're afraid, you won't do something. You understand me? If you're afraid, you won't do something. If you're afraid of heights, I guarantee you that you won't go to the Olympic Games to go and take part in, either pole vault or diving or things like from, you know, from those heights. Part of the answer is that afraid of what? Or afraid of, of who? I find it difficult to bring myself to be afraid of anybody. I'm afraid, I'm afraid of God only. That's very, very good. Very, very inspiring, really. And, you know, leaders, leaders, you know, um, uh, business leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, captains of industry, you know, need to, need to show boldness, need to show courage. Uh, uh, that itself is, is inspiring, even to folks uh, behind uh, behind them, and of course, we can see that even nationally, the, a lot of the youths uh, looking up to you, even for uh, for the stand you've taken on 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 several national issues. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having uh, the conversation with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All the best.